Firstly, you need to know that I love my wife. You and I both need to absolutely accept that, because if not, what I've done is unbelievable, and maybe unforgivable. I first met Amanda four years ago at a friend's roller rink birthday party. I didn't know how to skate. She didn't either. Barely able to move, surrounded by people half our age doing tricks and dance moves, we locked eyes and burst out laughing. Like awkward crabs, we lumbered to the middle of the rink and got acquainted. The rest, as they say, is history. A simple description isn't enough to understand why two people fall for each other. I could tell you that my wife Amanda has grey eyes and freckles, is 5'6 and about 140 pounds, and that she usually keeps her rust-colored hair in a high ponytail, but that doesn't explain why I'm in love with her. To understand that, you'd have to watch her stirring pasta sauce with one hand while she dances barefoot and sings along to the 80s hits blasting out of our staticky radio. You'd need to have been there while she squeezed my hand during my brother's funeral, then planned a mountain getaway for the two of us, even though I barely spoke for weeks. You'd need to know that her only pajamas are a pair of my old boxer shorts, and that she wakes me up with a hug before she leaves for work. Or at least, she used to. Before Amanda's accident, I'd have struggled to remember even one of those examples, but since this nightmare began, I recall those memories with a vividness and detail that I didn't notice before. On the night of the crash, other drivers reported seeing nothing but white and losing control on an icy roadway. The paramedics assure me that the same thing happened to my wife, but it's impossible to know. You see... Amanda was legally deceased for several minutes. She has no memory at all of what happened. Or so I thought. Physically, Amanda made a spectacular recovery. Two months after the accident, she was walking again. Two months after that, she was jogging. By the six-month mark, we had run our first 10k as a couple and backpacked parts of the Appalachian Trail. Since Amanda experienced significant head trauma, doctors were most concerned with her mental health, but there too my wife exceeded our wildest hopes. Amanda had always been creative and a little flighty. What she hated most about her job as a middle school teacher were tedious tasks like number crunching and grading, but these days she has an intense focus that wasn't there before. Our piano, for example... It was a family heirloom from Amanda's grandfather that had sat in our living room gathering dust since we moved in together. At most, Amanda would play a slurred version of Chopsticks, or The Entertainer after a boozy dinner party. As I write this, it's well past midnight. Leaning back in my chair, I see a ray of golden light from the living room door, and the house is silent except for the haunting notes of Lacrimosa echoing down the hallway. Amanda told me after dinner that she wanted to get the piece absolutely perfect. She hasn't stopped playing since. When I offered her a glass of water, it was like she didn't even notice I was there. I watched her sway on the piano bench, eyes closed, her complete attention on each note, and I realized that I didn't dare to insist or break her concentration. I imagined her eyelids snapping open to reveal angry pools of inky darkness, bony hands closing around my throat, and I realized that I was afraid of the woman I love. It's understandable that a person should change after such a traumatic event, right? I tell myself that Amanda's strange new intensity is just a way to cope, and I tell myself that's still my wife in front of me, and that I should be supporting her but I'm struggling to believe in myself. I can't tell if what I'm experiencing is normal or not, because I have nothing to compare it to. Being home alone with Amanda used to feel comforting and cozy. Now, it's more like being trapped in a tiny boat with a wild animal, cut off from the rest of the world. Amanda has more energy than ever. She talks and jokes like always, but no longer looks into my eyes when she speaks. 
It's more like she's observing me, the way a hawk watches a mouse. If it weren't for the lack of intimacy, I think I could learn to live with the rest of it. Intimacy is a word that feels forbidden to a lot of men from my generation. Something we feel we shouldn't talk about, much less need. With Amanda, I felt truly intimate with another person for the first time in my life. We were open about giving and receiving affection, physical, sexual, and emotional. A smile, a glance, or a caress could turn into something electrifying. We felt each other. We clicked. Of course, all of that is gone now. Amanda and I have barely touched each other since the incident. At first, she'd simply say, I'm not ready. Of course, I accepted. Months later, however, nothing has changed, and Amanda still refuses to discuss the topic. With a smile and a wave, she launches into a plan for our next activity or disappears to work on one of her endless personal projects. But there's no hiding that something is wrong with my wife. She barely eats or drinks. On the rare occasions that I'm able to touch her, Amanda's skin is cold yet somehow feverish at the same time. She always pulls away before I can confirm my suspicions. Yesterday, she pulled away so fast that she sliced her arm with the bread knife she was using to make our breakfast. There was no blood. The flesh beneath my wife's skin was black, gray and mottled like a moldy sponge. Before I could examine her more closely, she rushed off to the bathroom. When she returned, the wound was gone. Not bandaged, not scarred over, just gone. She went right back to slicing bread, and when I tried to come closer, she looked from the knife to my chest in a way that frightened me. Once, it was like we could read each other's thoughts. Now, looking at the dark shape in bed beside me is like gazing into an abyss. Each night, Amanda lies in the bluish darkness of our bedroom perfectly still with her eyes closed, but I know she's not resting. She's waiting. Waiting for me to fall asleep. What she then does, I don't know. I'm not sure I want to know. The incident with the bread knife unnerved me more than I wanted to admit. If something was physically or mentally wrong with my wife, I had to make sure she got treatment. I had to force her to talk about this. Amanda was doing the laundry when I physically blocked the door with my body and confronted her. I told my wife that we hadn't hugged, kissed, or made love in months. I wasn't satisfied but I was willing to work through this as long as we got some professional help. I said some other things too, most of which came out in stammers and sounded better in my head. When my words finally trailed off, Amanda looked me up and down like I was just one other sheet that needed washing. Her face flushed, and something moved behind her eyes. For a second... It was as though her whole face would twist and contort itself into an expression of horrible rage. Finally, she seemed to come back into control of herself. Amanda forced a smile, told me she'd take care of it, and drove off in her mint-colored Honda without telling me where she was going. It was dusk when the doorbell rang. Worried about my wife and not expecting visitors, I approached with caution. I was halfway down the immaculate wooden hallway when my wife walked in with a younger woman in tow. The girl didn't look exactly like my Amanda when we'd started dating, but was similar enough in the dim light that I did a double take. The girl wore her hair and makeup exactly as Amanda had in one of our first photos. She was even wearing the same clothes. Consider this my surrogate. Amanda indicated the girl without any pretext or introduction at all. Maybe it was just the dim hallway or the strangeness of the situation, but Amanda's voice didn't sound like her own. It grated and warbled, like more than one voice was speaking to use my wife's mouth. You're what? I sighed. Honey, who is this? Look, I addressed the girl. 
I know we haven't met, but my wife and I are going through a lot lately, and I'd like to have a quick talk with her in private, okay? The girl didn't respond, just stared vacantly into space. I felt a sensation I'd almost forgotten. Amanda's hand on my shoulder and her lips just inches from my ear. Do you like her? She'll do anything you want, my wife cooed. Anything at all. I don't want her, I shouted. I want you. I want to figure out what's wrong with us. No matter how much I struggled, I couldn't escape from my wife's cold, unflinching grasp. This is how it has to be, honey. I felt Amanda's tongue caress my earlobe as she whispered. I can't give you what you want. It's too dangerous. But she can. And if you don't want her, we'll get you another one. Just tell us what you want, baby. Anything at all. My wife's tongue wormed its way into my ear canal. It was cold and wet and far too long, and somehow I knew it was as black as her wound had been earlier. The look-alike embraced me. The girl's hungry lips searched for mine. Amanda held me in place, squeezing my shoulder till I wanted to scream in pain. Get away from me, I roared. I shoved the girl so hard she fell backwards and hit her head against the front doorknob. When she looked up, fear and confusion had replaced the vacant look in her eyes. Who... who are you people? The girl whimpered. Where am I? Amanda rolled her eyes and stormed toward the girl, ignoring her pitiful protests. My wife covered her look-alike's mouth with one hand and twisted her head with the other. A horrible crack echoed through the silent house. My wife had snapped the girl's neck like a twist-off bottle cap. A white foam dribbled out of the dead girl's mouth. We love you, babe, said a voice like my wife's mixed with a thousand others. But sometimes you really drive us crazy. You're not Amanda, I stated flatly to the thing in front of me. You're wrong, my wife's voice responded. Without the chorus of voices speaking alongside her, she sounded very small and alone. I'm here. It's just... I'm not here alone anymore. I made a deal. This way we can all experience life again. It's how it has to be. How can I explain it to you? It's just... My wife's voice faded as a chorus joined in. It's all so different on the other side. What can I say? I love my wife. That's why I kept watch in the roadside swamp where she buried that girl's body. We didn't talk much in the car, but I feel like we're taking an important step together. Amanda seems to think so too. When we got home, she prepared a delicious meal of spicy chicken alfredo, sourdough bread, tomato arugula salad, and white wine. She watched me devour it with an empty plate in front of her and a smug smile on her face. Some sort of bridge has been crossed, and from now on, I doubt she'll even bother pretending to eat or sleep anymore. Now I sit awake, typing, trying to calm the adrenaline pounding through my veins, listening to the chords of Lacrimosa reverberating through the silent house. I've made my decision. I love my wife, and till death do us part isn't long enough for me. dad built his dream cabin in the southern Ozarks back in 1991, a reward to himself for achieving early retirement. The damn thing took nearly a year to build, what with the county having to actually build the road to my family's property at the top of a small mountain. I was 14 at the time, and yes, we were wealthy, but the cabin didn't reflect that. 
was simple. Unlike most of the monstrosities you see in places like Aspen these days. And at that age, I was ruined into thinking that I'd rather live in a city where I'd have an easier time being spoiled rotten. I despised being there, to say the least. We moved into the cabin in midwinter, a couple of weeks before Christmas. Everyone was excited, except me, to be moving in to enjoy Christmas morning in front of the big-ass fireplace my dad gloated over. Amelia, my little sister, was six at the time, and she was elated that Santa would have such an easy entry point. Our old house didn't even have a chimney. Looking back, the first day was an omen, but there was no way we could have known. We pulled up to the cabin around noon on December 12th, my sister playing Kirby's Dreamland on her Game Boy and me listening to Nirvana on my Walkman. Again, I was not excited. Mom and Dad were chipper, as usual, and it was grating on my nerves. My dad wouldn't shut up about how he'd had that fireplace hooked into the central system so that all the heat would be distributed evenly throughout the house. We all began unloading what we had in the back of the Bronco, everything else having been moved in at great expense a few days before. My father's annoyingly happy face drooped into a mild frown when he shouldered open the front door. Looks like the movers didn't care too much about the new carpet, he said sarcastically. There, in the living room, starting where the wood floors ended from the foyer, was a trail of footprints in the carpet, apparently made with soot, leading from just in front of the entry, to the fireplace, to the back door. I snorted at my father's comment, which earned me a side eye for the ages for my mom. We sat down while we were carrying in our respective rooms, and of course, I was tasked with cleaning up the mess while my dad called the moving company to complain. Whilst I was scrubbing and fuming, it occurred to me that if the footprints were in fact soot, that it would be hard to explain why the fireplace had already been used in a brand new cabin. At the time, I assumed that there had to have been a test run by the builder to ensure everything was in working order. It took me about an hour to bring the carpet to my parents' satisfaction, and then I promptly went to my new room to continue wallowing in my teenage angst. That night, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched in the shower, that someone was standing just on the other side of the curtain. I tried to ignore it, but the feeling worsened when I closed my eyes to wash my hair and face. Finally, I pulled back the curtain, feeling foolish for being such a wimp. Of course, I found nothing unusual. I wrote my paranoia off as just being pissed off from the move and didn't think much of it. I didn't have another strange encounter for several days, but about a week after I got the shower stalker vibe, Amelia let my mom and I know about her new friend at the breakfast table. How did everyone sleep last night? My mother asked, trying to get through my solemn disdain. Fine, I replied, through a mouthful of scrambled eggs. I played with the man behind the curtains, Amelia exclaimed. I told him that he would be in big trouble if he kept getting the rug dirty. Oh, that's wonderful, honey, my mom said. I'm glad you've made a friend. Tell them I said thank you for not getting any more stains on the carpet. It made me bitter, listening to my mom placate my sister while I was in social isolation. Mom just kept sipping her coffee and reading the newspaper that Dad paid extra to have delivered out that far in the wilderness. And there was no fear in my sister's voice, and neither of us even remotely considered the possibility that her new friend was anything more than imaginary. Later that day... I was taking some folded laundry to my sister's room. I put it in her drawer, turned to walk out, and I saw them. Two charcoal shoe prints under the window curtain, as if someone had been hiding there. Initially, 
I disregarded them as leftover from the moving crew, just like the others. I ignored them. Let mom clean them up, I thought to myself. But it kept nagging at me. I had helped Amelia get settled into her room, and I would have noticed them. They weren't there before. I still don't know why, but I never told my parents about them. I ultimately did go back to clean them up, then carried on. Amelia surely had made them somehow as part of her relationship with her new friend. That night, December 23rd, I had trouble sleeping. The feeling that I was being watched had returned shortly after the discovery in Amelia's room, and I hadn't been able to shake it. I hadn't admitted to myself yet, but a microscopic part of my imagination had begun to suspect something amiss. At 14, I still hadn't quite squashed the fear of ghosts. I kept looking across the room, into the back of my open closet, half expecting someone to be standing there, their shoes covered in black dust. I felt shame for being scared, but finally, I drifted off sometime around midnight. I still can't remember what woke me. I just know that my sheets were being damp with sweat when I came to. I felt again that I was being watched, and I began scanning the dark room through my blurry, just waking up vision. I followed my curtains down to the floor and saw them, soiled, black feet poking out from beneath them. I jumped a bit, then rubbed my eyes and looked back. There were no shoes, but the curtain was moving ever so slightly. I looked at my closet door, which had been shut without a sound. Cowering, I pulled my blankets over my head, knowing that if I pulled them down, something would be there, sitting at the end of my bed. After a while, I tried to sleep, but couldn't. Of course, I was blamed the next day for the dirty tracks to and from my room. They began and ended in front of our fireplace, just like the first time, but they clearly led to my bedroom closet and back. My parents gave me a big speech about how I needed to accept my new circumstances and start treating everyone and everything with a lot more respect. I didn't have the energy to fight with them. All I could think about were the footprints and the thing that had spent the night with me. I just rolled my eyes and accepted my punishment. Clean up the prints and then no Walkman until I straightened up. It wasn't like they'd believe me, so why say anything? I scrubbed the carpets that day in a daze, remembering what Amelia had said a few days before I'd breakfast. My thoughts raced for rational explanations, but I kept arriving at this strange amalgamation of ghosts and Santa Claus. Despite everything going on, I still had Christmas morning on my mind, just like anyone that age. Yet, by the time I had finished cleaning, I had resigned myself to try and sort out what was going on. I would start with my sister. That night, after an almost silent dinner, I went to Amelia's room to do some gentle prying. As I rounded the door frame, I found her staring up at the ceiling vent. The floor around her bed was covered in that morning's newspaper. What's all this for? I asked, trying to remain calm despite already knowing the answer. For the man that likes to hide in the curtains, she almost whispered. I told him I would keep the floor clean. He doesn't like leaving tracks because he's afraid I'll have to leave if Mommy and Daddy find out about him. He said that if I did that for him, he'd take me to visit his house. He says that there are lots of other kids there I could play with. All of this, she said as a matter of fact, as if she and the man had been best friends for years and I should know these things. I almost lost what little cool I had left, my eyes widening and my mouth opening to scorn her for being so naive, but I caught myself, resolving to try and solve the mystery on my own, 
without shaming a six-year-old. As appalling as it was, I decided to use my sister as bait to catch whoever or whatever was leaving the damned footprints in the carpet and possibly planning a kidnapping. Okay, I began. Just make sure you tell mom and dad that all the newspaper is for watercolors or something. That way they don't get suspicious. I will, she replied enthusiastically. Thank God Amelia was six and didn't need a lot of explanation. I left her room with terrified curiosity, wondering what Christmas Eve would have in store. For what seemed to be the hundredth time, I lay in bed, unable to fall asleep. I watched my clock tick for seconds, minutes, hours. I knew that should anything actually arrive in Amelia's room, I'd hear the crumpling of paper. I also knew that Amelia would be awake, desperate not only for her new friend to come out, but also for the sound of sleigh bells. Just as I began to drift, sometime around one in the morning, I heard it, the sound of rustling newspaper. I hoisted myself out of the sleeping, awake twilight I was in and ejected myself from bed too stricken with urgency to consider being quiet. I landed on my floor with a thud, and immediately I heard my sister whine from across the hall. Please, don't go. No, come back, she cried. I raced out of my bedroom, older sibling protective instincts at full tilt, and into the hallway just in time to be stopped in my tracks. A tall, willowy silhouette stood at the living room end of the hallway. The thing, or man, stood so tall that it stooped, bending at the ceiling, using its long, spindly arms to brace against the walls. The lunar glow coming in through the skylight was just enough to show me that it was uniformly pale, almost paper white, and without clothes. I stared up at what I thought should be its face, its lack of features slightly disorienting. It had two indentations where there should have been eyes, as if there were once sockets but skin had been stretched over them. I thought I saw a small slit that must have been a mouth. I began to notice that its body seemed thin, almost two-dimensional, and then it moved. I gasped as it moved with unnatural motion, as if its joints were the result of being creased and folded into a box, using its abnormally gangly arms to balance on the floor and lurch to the living room. For a moment, I considered just going back to my room, but I'd come too far. I summoned what little courage I had and edged towards the living room, peeking around the corner of the hallway's end. In the moonlight, I followed the trail of grayish footprints with my eyes up to the fireplace, where the twin doors into the hearth stood open. I caught a glimpse of a limb being retracted into the chimney. I just stared, not daring to move, not daring to breathe too loudly or deeply, lest it come back for me. Amelia broke me from the trance. Don't hurt him, she whispered meekly from behind me. I spun around, startled, my heart thumping in my chest. We locked eyes for a moment, me not believing what I'd seen, Amelia not comprehending why I seemed so disheveled. Finally, I found words. Go back to bed, Amelia, I stammered. No, he won't hurt you, he won't, she started to tear up. I kept finding myself unable to speak, as if this thing in our fireplace had stolen my vocabulary. I just kept standing there, watching Amelia weep as if I was taking away a new puppy. In my head, I was sprinting, trying to weigh out the options. I took Amelia by the hand and went to the hallway closet for my dad's mag light. I crept back to the fireplace. Amelia mercifully not fighting my grip. 
I sat for a moment. Amelia, if anything happens when I look up the chimney, you run and wake up mom and dad. Do you understand? Amelia nodded. I took a deep breath and I leaned back into the fireplace as I turned on the flashlight and looked up. A sheet white face met mine. The creature hanging upside down and craning its neck to face me. There were no eyes, but a round black hole for a mouth, gaping to reveal a seemingly bottomless oblivion. I scrambled out of the earth and collapsed there in the floor, waiting for it to come out after me as my chest heaved, but it never did. At some point, I got up, ignoring my sister's questions and pleading as a numb, thoughtless state came over me. I took the fireplace matches, doused the carpet in lighter fluid from a kitchen cabinet, and set the carpet ablaze. That place be damned. Amelia and I never told our parents what happened, and I can't remember much of what happened in the immediate aftermath. After hundreds of hours of therapy, the only solid thing I can retrieve after looking up the chimney that horrifying Christmas morning is sitting out in the snow with my family, pulling my knees to my chest as we waited for the fire department from a distant town, Amelia wailing about her friend burning alive. By the time the fire trucks got there, the cabin had burned to the ground. None of the firemen even bothered turning on their hoses. The therapists tell my parents that I've got repressed memories as a result of being so miserably sequestered from society at a time when social development is paramount. What a bunch of bullshit. Amelia wouldn't talk to me for a long time because from her perspective, I'd murdered her friend. A few years later, she began to comprehend. We talked, we reconciled, and we agreed never to speak of it. The fire was attributed to a likely electrical problem within the system that distributed the heat from the fireplace. I guess small town forensic scientists don't know what accelerants look like. My parents never quite understood why Amelia was convinced that I had caused the fire when the fire department said otherwise. It strained us for a while, but eventually I guess they just let it go as Amelia's vivid imagination. The day after, we were allowed to sift through the smoldering rubble to try and salvage anything we could. All that we found were a set of footprints that led into the woods and didn't return to the house. We followed them, but eventually they disappeared abruptly. My parents don't know who they could have possibly belonged to, but Amelia and I do. My ex always hated our dog, but he probably would have taken her too if she weren't so ugly. If Lulu were one of those cute mini golden doodles or corgis, or even one of those goofy looking dogs that are charming in their ugliness, think Danny DeVito or Steve Buscemi, only in dog version, then I have no doubt he would have claimed ownership of her too, along with everything else in our apartment. But Lulu is just a plain old ugly dog, and for that and so much else about her, I'm forever grateful. I don't want to talk about my ex too much here, because this isn't about him, but I do need to explain why I was traveling across the country in the middle of the night with my few worldly possessions loaded up in the back of a bumpy U-Haul van. My ex and I had been together six years, never married. He said marriage was outdated, and I said fine. Was I upset by that? Yes and no. Well, yes. But I kept quiet. I loved him. Five months ago, he tells me he wants to split up. He said it just like that. 
I want to split up. No shaking of the hands, no tears in his eyes, not even a change in the tone of his voice. I was in the kitchen when it happened, eating honey bunches of oats for breakfast. He was standing in the hall. I want to split up, he said, and then he grabbed his bag and left for work, leaving me to sob as my cereal got soggy in the bowl. Lulu heard me crying and nuzzled her snout in my lap. She whimpered along with me as the hours went by. I skipped work that day, sat on the couch and watched the sunlight pass over the walls of the apartment I had always thought of as our home together. The thing is, my ex made way more money than me. He was happy to cover the bulk of the rent, he'd said. Happy to buy the furniture. Happy to lease the new car for us. Happy to pay for this and that, loading up our apartment with nice things. When the time came for me to move all the things that were actually mine out of the place, I realized I had even less than I did six years ago. It all barely filled the U-Haul van. I didn't have a couch or chairs. Those were on his paper. I didn't have any dishes or silverware. We'd thrown out my old ones when he'd bought a fancy new set a couple of years ago. I didn't even have a mattress. He'd gotten us an expensive memory foam king size. I remember I'd always wanted to let Lulu hop up on that bed to snuggle while we watched movies in our room. My ex wouldn't hear it. Stop treating the dog like it's a person, he'd said. She's lucky she gets to live inside the apartment with us. I was the one who got Lulu from the pound, back when she was a puppy. She's a street dog, or she was until the people from Animal Control swept her up one day as she'd been rummaging through an overturned trash can. You can tell she's got a good amount of pit bull in her, but beyond that she's an all-American mutt with a big boulder of a head, a weirdly thin body and stumpy legs. She waddles more than she walks, and she snores like crazy, but she's a total sweetheart. When she sees kids, she lies on her belly and waits until they get close before she gives them kisses. We didn't even train her to do that. One afternoon about a year or so ago, Lulu came up behind my ex and licked his ankles, and he turned and gave her a small kick right in the head. It wasn't enough to hurt Lulu, but that was when I should have known. Looking back, it's amazing how much you can convince yourself someone is who they're not. So, the U-Haul was packed, I'd quit my hourly job, and I was now on the road toward my sister's place in Spartanburg, South Carolina, where I'd been promised a place to stay for the time being. It was a ten plus hour drive, just Lulu and me in the front of the van as we rumbled through the endless pastoral of farmland and cow towns. I'd purposefully decided to take the smaller highway to avoid traffic since I was still uncomfortable driving the U-Haul, and the scenery made me glad I did. Tall fast food signs rose up into the sky like totem poles against clouds so big and white, they almost made you want to cry. But I'd promised myself I was done crying, or at least until I'd gotten off the road. I'd had to pack the U-Haul by myself, so it had already been early afternoon by the time I set off. After about four hours on the road, the sky began to dim over the highway. Just as the sun sunk beneath the ridges of the mountains in the distance, I heard a loud clang somewhere below my feet. All at once, the U-Haul van started shaking. It felt like the wheel was fighting against me. I kept having to grip it and yank it back straight. I had trouble seeing out the back window because my stuff was piled up but I managed to get over to an exit that was just ahead. As I slowed the van down now that I was off the highway, I saw a sign sticking out from the roadway. Richard and Sons Auto Repair. A quarter mile ahead. I know you've probably heard a story like this before. A story where a car breaks down in the middle of nowhere on a back roads highway. A young woman by herself. Maybe she meets a creepy guy in overalls who says something like, Well, you must be lost, little missy, as he eyes her like she's a good meal he's about to devour. But it really wasn't like that. 
Evening, ma'am, said the perfectly normal-looking guy inside the auto repair shop. Uh, how can I help you? Oh, and who's this cutie? He added, taking notice of Lulu at my side. The shop's owner was a man named Richard Meadows, and he was a pleasant, polite, and well-dressed older gentleman. His gray hair neatly combed and his buttoned shirt starched bright white. He ran the place with his two sons, both of whom were waiting in the garage. My sons Abel and Dean will run diagnostics. Then you and I can head into the office to call the U-Haul folks, Richard said as we walked up to them. Don't want this to be on your tab, after all. Abel, want to take the keys? I handed the keys to the son named Abel, who was a little chubby and pale, his shaved head dotted with moles. He seemed shy and only nodded when he took the keys from me. I only mentioned Abel's appearance because the other son beside him, Dean, was almost shockingly handsome. He had a thick head of sandy blonde hair, a chiseled jawline, and broad shoulders under his denim work shirt. He was that level of teen movie heartthrob handsome that made my face suddenly hot. Walking with me out to the U-Haul in the lot, Dean took out a clipboard, licking the tip of the pen as he angled it downward. So, the truck just started rattling on you? He asked. I stuttered through what had happened, feeling like a nervous high school girl again. But he just smiled and nodded the whole time, his voice calm like a doctor at a bedside. Hmm, well, I'm sure we'll figure it out. And like my dad said, don't worry. We'll make sure the U-Haul folks pay up, not you. I thanked him, trying to ignore the fact that I was blushing for no reason. Good thing you've got a bodyguard here with you, Dean added, smiling down at Lulu. What's his name? Her, I said. And her name is Lulu. Well, hi there, Lulu. When he reached down to pet her, Lulu stepped back and showed her teeth growling under her breath. Lulu, I said. Bad girl. Dean just laughed. Nah, she's cool. Just protecting our mom, right Lulu? Honestly, I wouldn't trust some random auto repair dude either. No, it's not you. It's just my boyfriend. Or, I guess my ex-boyfriend now. He just... Yeah, I don't know. I guess he made her a little skittish around guys like you. Dean raised his eyebrows a little, but then he pursed his lips and nodded as if he understood, and I appreciated that he didn't ask anything further about it. He told me to go wait on him, that he'd handle everything from here. When I got back to the office, Dean's father Richard had already sorted out the bill with the U-Haul folks. Free and clear, he said. There was nothing else to do but wait for the van to be ready. A TV hanging in the corner was playing a muted episode of Judge Judy. Richard took a seat across from me in the waiting area and petted Lulu while telling me a little about himself and his family. His wife had died a year and a half ago, he said. Passed suddenly in her sleep, which is a mercy, I suppose. It had been a tough string of months, but he and his sons were close. They were getting him through it. Lulu seemed to sense his sadness, because she showed more attachment to him than most other male strangers. I hope you don't mind me speaking out of turn, Richard said as he stroked Lulu's head. But I'm relieved you have this dog here with you. Why's that? Well, not to scare you, but there have been some... incidents. He told me he didn't want me to cause any undue worry but there had been seven women found dead in the woods beyond the cornfields down the highway over the past year and a half. All the victims were like you, young women traveling alone, Richard said. So it's good you got this girl here. And he put his face close to Lulu, who licked him on the cheek. Ah, good girl, such a sweetie. I mean, I appreciate you giving me a heads up at least, I said. Sure, and like I said, didn't mean to scare you. Probably nothing. No, it's nice of you. 
You guys have all been really nice, I added. Dean was... he was very helpful. That's just the wonderful service and dedication you would expect from the world-famous team at Richard and Sons Auto Repair, Richard laughed. But I do thank you, sincerely. I almost asked if Dean had a girlfriend, as if that weren't a totally crazy and pathetic question to pose to a total stranger. But before I had the chance to embarrass myself, the other son, Abel, shuffled into the office and murmured something to his father. Richard nodded, saying to me, Well, looks like you're all set. No paperwork or anything? Nope, all taken care of. Get you a receipt for insurance purposes, but otherwise you're good to go. Here, let me walk you and Lulu out. On our way out of the office, I debated the merits of giving Dean my number, trying to balance the pros and cons. Was it better to risk wild embarrassment if I get rejected, versus the regret I might feel if I did nothing? I was so new to the single life again that I didn't know how any of this worked anymore. It turns out the decision was made for me, because Dean was gone when we got to the van. Dean head off already? Richard asked. Abel nodded. Had a date, he said in that whisper-quiet voice of his. Oh, another date. Why am I not surprised? Of course, I thought. And really, what did I expect? Just because Dean was working at some Nowheresville auto repair shop didn't change the fact that he was still wildly handsome and easy to talk to. If anything, girls probably swooned over the fact that he could take a car apart by hand, peeling off his shirt afterward, his muscles gleaming with sweat, etc, etc. I felt like an idiot. Well, sure was great to meet you, Richard said. And so nice to meet you too, Miss Lulu. His son Abel reached into his pocket and dangled the keys out in front of me, while Richard got down and gave Lulu one last head scratch. I took the keys from Abel and smiled. Thank you, I said. He smiled back, but he didn't break eye contact. And for a split second, a shudder passed through my body. Something I can't explain. Drive safe, he breathed. The back road highway that night was dark dark. What my sister would call country dark. But I would call horror movie dark. It seemed the smaller highways like this were only busy during the day. Because I only saw a car pass by every few minutes or so. Fields of corn along the roadside swayed under a cloud-choked moon. The night air was punctuated by faraway train whistles, which sounded to me more like muffled screams. I don't know if I was just freaked out by the warning Richard had given me, or if there was really something to be said about this stretch of highway, but I kept getting a feeling as if eyes were staring out at me from the fields. I sensed I was driving into the mouth of the beast, already on my way to being digested by the darkness. Up ahead, the cornfields ended and were overtaken by forest, a dense swath of evergreen trees. And the moment we drove past the fields, Lulu started barking. I swear I almost crashed the car. Oh my god, Lulu, Lulu calm down. She was going crazy turning her head side to side as she barked at whatever we just passed on the side of the road. Lulu, relax, girl. But I couldn't even say that without my own voice choking up. Seven women found dead in the woods beyond the cornfields, Richard had said. My hands felt slippery on the wheel. I'd never been comfortable driving a U-Haul van before, and it didn't help that the darkness seemed to devour the headlamps so that I could barely see a few feet in front of me down the highway. I tried turning on the radio, got static, and turned the dial, but then thought the better of it and shut it off again. Better to be in silence, just in case. In case what? My mind was going in so many directions, and even saying there was silence would be wrong, because every few minutes Lulu started up again, pawing at the back seat and the windows, barking like crazy and growling. 
It was like she was fighting a ghost and wanted to break out of the car. I glanced out the windows but could only see darkness on either side of the road. That, along with the shadowed outlines of trees, stumps, power lines, all of which looked like monsters to me. And eventually, we entered South Carolina. We passed out of the rural area, and it was only when the bright flood lamps of passing car dealerships and 24-hour fast food places illuminated the inside of the cabin that Lulu fell silent. But even then, for the last three hours of the car ride, she never fully relaxed. Especially when we passed through the occasional pockets of empty rural areas, she seemed stressed. Occasionally, she'd perk up, as if she'd seen someone outside our window, floating along with us. Her body language would stiffen. By now, I just let it happen. I told myself she was just tense from traveling. She seemed desperate by the end of the trip. I could tell she was exhausted. She hadn't slept all night. I was exhausted too. Lulu's howls and barks had kept me alert but it hadn't exactly done well for keeping my eyes on the road. I felt the kind of twitchy panic that usually came from drinking too much coffee, my eyes darting from side to side, feeling like I was about to crash into something any minute. My sister had texted me before she went to bed and told me the key was under the mat. It was around 3am when I pulled up to the curb outside her house and put the van in park. When I did, Lulu shot up. Okay, yes, we're here, girl. You can relax now. In the glow of the van's cab, as I reached over to grab my night bag, I could hear Lulu breathing deeply. She was taking fast and muffled breaths, panting. It sounded like she was trying to catch her breath after running. Hey, chill out, I said as I grabbed my bag and sat up again. What are you panting for, girl? We're already... I froze. Lulu was totally still beside me. She was facing the back of the van. Her mouth was closed. Her tongue wasn't hanging out. Her chest wasn't rising and falling. She was calm and focused, breathing slowly and silently. It wasn't her. The breathing wasn't her. It was coming from somewhere in the back of the van. Just then... Lulu showed her teeth and growled. Oh, okay girl, I said, trying to keep my voice normal. I was shaking. I could barely feel my body. I was floating outside of it. Let's, let's head on inside now. Come on. I fumbled with the door handle. I almost fell when I stepped out. I tried taking out my phone and dialing 911, but my hand was shaking so bad I couldn't even unlock my phone screen. Lulu hopped out and circled me. She was on high alert. Her head was low and she moved like a predator, keeping close to my legs. I walked backwards with her up the driveway, but she stayed between me and the van, pacing quickly from side to side. I managed to get my phone unlocked. I was about to hit the emergency call button when I heard something move inside the van. A metallic click. The back door, I realized. I'd locked it, but it could still open from the inside. The street was dark, only one lamppost glowing off at the intersection down the road. Everyone in their homes was asleep. I was totally alone. In the darkness... I heard something scrape at the back door from inside the van, then a soft clunk as the door opened. It opened slowly at first, as if a creature inside were checking to see if it were safe. I hit the emergency call button just as the door swung all the way open. 911, what's your emergency? 911, what's your emergency? But I couldn't speak. I was frozen. The door bounced back as it fully opened, and then out fell a naked body, tangled limbs hitting the pavement, a mess of blonde hair shimmering in the dark. When the person rose up again, I almost passed out. It was Dean. Hello? Hello, I said into the phone. 
I need... I need help. Someone. He was in my van. Please send police to... Lulu barked and jumped forward. Jesus fucking Christ, Dean said, shaking out his limbs. Can someone please tell this fucking dog to shut up? Dean was covered in sweat, wearing only his boxer shorts. He looked sickly and diseased. All fucking night it's just bark, 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 yap, yap, yap. He exhaled and stretched out his arms, and I saw he was holding a knife in his hand. With his free hand, he swiped back the sweaty hair off his forehead. Cooped up in a hot ash truck for hours under all your useless shit. I had to take off my clothes, it was so damn hot. And I gotta hear that fucking dog barking non-stop? Please, send help, I said into the phone, repeating my sister's address over and over. Please, he's got a knife. Oh, he's got a knife, does he? Oh, boo-hoo. And Dean walked forward, holding the knife out toward Lulu, tossing it casually from hand to hand. Every time I try to make a move, this bitch goes nuts on me. Yap, 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 yap. Dean, please, just... I don't know what you want, but please. You should be thanking me, you know that? He waved the knife from side to side, as if reprimanding me. I'm way out of your league. So the fact that I chose you tonight, it's really an act of charity. Okay, I said. I would have said anything to get him to go away. Okay, I'm sorry. You want the truth? It wasn't even me who wanted you. I thought you were a six, maybe a seven at best. But my brother? He thought you looked tasty enough. So I say, okay, fine, sure. I'll get you and bring you back to him. I'm a good brother, aren't I? That's what good brothers do. They do favors. I wanted his first time to be special. No, I know, I know. You're a good brother. I still held the phone up to my ear, hoping the operator could hear me. This all could have been so easy. So fucking easy. Would have been over by now. But no, because Miss Yap 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 over here. He gripped the knife tight, squatting as he stepped forward his eyes on Lulu. So keep on crying into the phone, but make sure you tell them your dog is dead too, because the bitch deserved it. No! Dean lunged forward, slashing the knife at her. Lulu yelped and flipped to the side as the blade swept across her back, her body scrambling over the pavement. But then it was Dean who screamed, falling back as his knife landed on the ground. Fuck! Jesus Christ, my hand. Even in the darkness, I could see the blood pour from Lulu's back where the blade had sliced her open, but I could also see her spit out a mangled hand onto the pavement, as if it were nothing but a squeaky toy. I'm gonna kill this dog, Dean screamed. Blood poured from the stump at his wrist. With his other hand, he reached down to grab the knife, then turned to face her. But Lulu was already upon him, lunging up in the air, her own blood streaking off the gash in her back as she flew. This time, she aimed for his face. A severed hand, it turns out, is a more than adequate DNA sample. It only took a few days before the police were able to match Dean's DNA with the DNA found on the bodies of the seven women who were found in the woods down the highway from the auto repair shop. Dean's mugshot showed a guy with a mutilated, torn-up face, bruised and bloody and held together with stitches. When the police had arrived that night outside my sister's house, they had found him half dead on the sidewalk, blood leaking from his neck. As for Lulu and me, I had already carried her inside the house. The police found us on the towel floor of the kitchen, Lulu bleeding out of my lap, unmoving, while I whispered to her, I love you, girl. I love you so much. It wasn't long before Dean's brother Abel was arrested as an accessory to the crimes. During a news conference a few days later, the police chief said that for the past year and a half, the two brothers had been using road traps on the back road highway to cause damage to passing vehicles, forcing them to stop. 
In most cases, they fixed the cars and that was that. Nothing more than a scam to gain business for the father's shop. But when the driver was a pretty young woman, the two used the shop's tow truck to lure the women away to a remote location past the cornfields. DNA samples from at least four of the women were found inside the truck. With the last would-be victim, the brothers appeared to have gotten reckless and instead lured her right to the repair shop, said the police chief during the press conference. Had the young woman not been accompanied by her dog, a pit bull mix by the name of Lulu, there's no telling what. I closed my laptop. I didn't want to hear the rest. Later, I saw in an online article a photo of their father Richard shielding his face as reporters surrounded him. There was no evidence he'd been involved in any way. He'd seemed shocked when the police came to the auto shop. I felt bad for him. He seemed like a good man. I couldn't even imagine what he was thinking. The police chief had said the brothers had been committing the assaults and murders for the last year and a half, which means they would have started right after their mother died. The timing made me feel sick. Richard had said his wife's death was from natural causes, that she died peacefully in her sleep. I like to believe that's the case. I like to believe the brothers had waited for their mother to die, and that's the only reason they started their murderous spree right after her funeral. Despite all they did, I really hope, if only for Richard's sake, that they hadn't gotten impatient and done something to their own mother. It was surreal trying to get settled in a new place after all this. I felt like my old life had been years and years ago. My ex did text me once, though, just after he heard the news. Hope you're okay, the text said. Normally I would have sat for hours, deliberating over how to respond. But now I texted back right away. I am, I said. I watched three dots pop up in the bubble as he was typing something, and then they disappeared again. That night, the news ran a segment about Lulu. There was a whole ceremony in her honor. Normally, I wouldn't have watched the rest of the coverage of the case. It was already traumatic enough. I was told I would have to testify, that it would be a long process, and I wanted to avoid it as much as I could but I made sure to watch the news segment on Lulu. A moment of celebration today as Lulu the Scrappy Pitbull Mix gets a hero's welcome outside the Eastside Animal Hospital, said the news anchor. So many people had showed up to the animal hospital earlier that afternoon to celebrate Lulu's discharge. The footage held on Lulu's face as she eyed the crowd of police officers, the news crews, the reporters and hospital staff. I was right beside her in the footage, looking just as awkward. See that, girl? I said as I watched the coverage with her later that night. Lulu was curled on my lap on the couch as I stroked the long scar on her back, the jagged ridges where the animal doctors had sewn her up again. That's you and me on the news. See, girl? Lulu had been sleeping, and now she lifted up her head, drowsy from the commotion of the day. She didn't seem too interested about her 15 minutes of fame. She just sighed and plopped her head right back down again on my stomach and went back to sleep. When the news was over, I nudged Lulu awake, and after she went outside to pee, the two of us shuffled down the hallway. I led Lulu into the guest bedroom. As I pulled down the covers on the bed, Lulu went to lie down on the hardwood floor in the corner of the room by herself. No, no, come here, girl. She glanced up at me, one paw on top of the other. I patted the bed. You sleep up here from now. Come on up. She made a soft noise, her tail wagging. Then she hopped up awkwardly on the bed, still a little sore from her wounds. As I shut off the lamp, Lulu nuzzled up against my legs, resting her head on my thigh. Comfy? I asked. She sighed a grumbly, growling purr in response. Get used to it, pretty girl, I said. You've more than earned it.
of the events in this story happened to me in 2014 when I was living and working in rural Japan, but they still keep me awake at night. There are sights, sounds, and feelings that take me right back. A nocturnal animal scurrying just out of sight, faint laughter with no clear source, a sudden strange smell that comes out of nowhere in the dark. These things remind me that all this light and civilization is as thin as a corpse's skin, and if you peel it back, who knows what nightmarish things you might find gnawing underneath. When I made that mistake, I was teaching English in a town with fewer than 3,000 inhabitants, nestled in the mountains of a humid river valley. It could be lonely at times, but it was also a wonderful experience. Riding my bicycle through the fields at twilight, following cobwebbed trails to abandoned shrines, and sharing rice wine with my wizened, friendly neighbors. My biggest problem came from within. I never fully adjusted to the new time zone, and insomnia plagued me for the duration of my stay. I just couldn't find a good sleep schedule. Arriving home after my final class, I'd doze on the sun-warmed tatami mats until the long, cold shadows of twilight crept into the room. I'd usually nod off again just before dawn, then wake up and do it all over again. I kept one routine. My nightly trip to the 24-hour Kombini gas station along the main highway. I'd hop on my bike around midnight and pedal out into a dark, surreal world of croaking frogs and black river water glittering in the yellowish street lamp light. Sometimes, it felt like the scrawny teenage shop attendant and I were the last people awake in the world. I'd buy some snacks, flip through the magazines, and make a little small talk before riding off home. Until I experienced something that changed my routine forever. That night, my afternoon nap had stretched until about 2am, and I awoke ravenously hungry. As I rummaged through my rented home in search of food, I had an awful feeling that I'd missed something important and irreplaceable, and nothing would ever be the same again. The cool night air and the familiar lights of the Combini relaxed me as I rode into the empty parking lot. As I approached the door, I noticed there was no attendant inside. Behind the Combini, a car door slammed. I crept around the side of the building, not sure why I felt the need to be stealthy. Around back, four men stood between a dumpster and a black Mercedes. One was a Combini attendant with a single gold earring and spiked hair who I didn't recognize. I figured he was on the late, late shift. He wore rubber gloves and was messing with something in the car trunk. Two of the other men had on dark suits and sunglasses, even though it was night, and were whispering angrily at the third, who looked hastily dressed in an untucked gray shirt and loose necktie. Even with my low level of Japanese, I could tell they were berating him about damage to some merchandise. The attendant heaved the first trash bag out of the car trunk, revealing what was inside. A plastic tarp soaked in blood. A girl's corpse, chopped apart, messily. I clutched my mouth to hold back vomit or a scream, or both. Fear froze me in place as I watched the attendant drop bag after bag of what used to be a person like me into the Combini dumpster. When it was all over, the attendant threw away his gloves and accepted an envelope from one of the dark-suited men who shoved the disheveled buyer into the car. As their headlights sprang to life, I pressed myself up against the cold brick wall, praying that the beams would miss me. I shut my eyes as the black Mercedes rumbled by, seemingly oblivious to my presence. The attendant locked the back door as he returned to his post, and I was left panting in the darkness. Had I made it? I thought I was alone at last. When a pair of eyes like golden lamps sprang open on the forested hills across from me, and some night animal, a fox maybe, made a loud exit to the undergrowth. 
and I must have gasped, because I heard the Combini attendant grunt angrily and grab something, his footsteps rushing for the front door. I kicked over a box of recycled bottles for added chaos, then bolted for my bike. As I pedaled for my life, I risked one backwards glance. The beefy attendant was standing silhouetted by the Combini lights, a huge meat cleaver in his hand. The right thing would have been to call the police immediately. If I had, I may have been spared the strange events that followed. Or I, too, might have disappeared into several black bags. It's difficult to know how far the consequences of action or inaction can lead. I needed time to process what I'd seen, to drink water, to plan what to say. By the time I finished, Don had turned the rice fields a misty shade of blue. I called the principal of my school and asked if she could request that a police officer meet me before school started. She was worried. She agreed. The officer was waiting for me when I arrived. Without his rumpled gray shirt, loose necktie, and a hacked apart corpse nearby, I almost didn't recognize him. My words choked in my throat as he smiled and bowed. The officer slash killer addressed me in the most polite way possible, but I knew he'd seen my initial reaction. The story I stammered about foxes getting into my trash was as fake as his smile, and he knew it. His gaze coolly probed for weakness, and the more he questioned me, the more I was sure that somehow he knew. When our muddled, awkward conversation finally ended, he gave me another smile and promised to keep an eye on me. Listening to the footsteps of his polished black shoes echoing ominously down the school corridor, it sounded more like a threat than a promise. I rushed back to the dumpster as soon as I could, but it was too late. The body was gone. They would get away with it. There would never be justice for that poor girl, and more would probably follow in her path. Why hadn't I checked the license plate number of the black Mercedes or called the police immediately? Bitter thoughts formed an ugly gray veil between me and the rest of the world, and it took me a long time to notice the golden eyes observing me from the other side of the riverbank as I trudged gloomily home. It was twilight when I arrived, but not so dark that I didn't see the figure waiting in the shadows of my porch. The last rays of light caught the shiny buttons on his police uniform. I stopped, turned on my heel, and headed back the way I came. I didn't think about how exposed I'd be down by the riverbank. I didn't think about the lack of light down there, or tall grass that could hide a body. I didn't think about how if you wanted to make sure someone never talked, that was the perfect place to do it. Like a hunted fox, I panicked and fled. I couldn't see my pursuer in the deepening darkness, but I could hear their footsteps. I was walking fast, rather than running, captive to the childish belief that if I didn't run, the person chasing me wouldn't either. And yet the further I walked along the riverbank pathway that led away from town and back toward the highway, the closer the footsteps seemed to get. The darkness under the bridge ahead was as black as an open grave, and I'd never felt more trapped or alone. The wind in the waist-high grass seemed to be whispering that I was going to die here, and that my family and friends would never know what happened. The footsteps were so close. If I turned around... Instead, I screamed and ran like mad under the bridge. My pursuer gave chase. Halfway through the inky blackness beneath the bridge, something happened that I still can't explain. I saw myself on the other side of the river, just beyond the dark underpass. This version of me looked as if it had run through the river, which wasn't deeper than knee height at any point, and seemed to glow faintly. This vision was so shocking that I stopped running, but the footsteps behind me didn't. They sloshed into the river, where they seemed to struggle, thrash, then stop. A horrible smell filled my nostrils, a mix of dirty wet hair, 
seaweed, and rotting fish. I slowly backed away toward the light as the ominous smell was followed by an even more frightening sound. Something was gnawing on bone. Beyond the bridge underpass, I panted and waited. It wasn't long before I saw bright gold buttons on the tattered remains of a police uniform floating down the river. For several weeks, the whole town was abuzz with gossip about the missing police officer. Something told me it wouldn't be long before the men in the black Mercedes came by to figure out exactly where he'd gone. The circumstances around me were strange and frightening, but I felt like I actually had a chance to bring the killers to justice. There was something more as well. I'd seen or heard the golden-eyed animal at least once a day since the incident at the bridge. It was like it was following me, willing me to do something. I'd long since stopped thinking of it as an ordinary animal, and the last thing I wanted to do was make it angry. That was why, despite the panic that rose in my chest every time I saw it, I began staking out the Kambini at night. The routine was fairly normal. The buff, spiky-haired attendant would show up nightly and appear to carry out a normal, boring night shift. Until I looked more closely. Sometimes a customer would buy a random item with a large amount of cash and receive a little packet under the counter instead of change. Girls in party clothes would spend far too much in the Combini restroom and leave wobbling on their heels. Nervous, single men would enter, pay, and receive a key, probably to a room at the local love hotel. The attendant looked more on edge than the last time I'd seen him calmly hacking up a corpse, but otherwise it looked like the racket was thriving. One night, I thought I had a perfect opportunity. The attendant ate a spicy tuna roll. From the look on his face and my own prior experience, I knew he was about to spend a long time in the restroom. Enough time to dash in, grab the bell to keep it from ringing, and snag whatever evidence the guy had stashed in the bottom drawer by the cash register. I was just about to slip behind the desk when the bathroom door stepped open and the attendant stepped out. He'd just been washing his hands. I froze. For a few moments, we stared each other down. You're cute, he grunted in casual Japanese. For a foreigner. He didn't recognize me, but I didn't feel any safer. He was coming toward me fast, and his smell of stale sweat and body spray was soon way too close for comfort. I was backed against the counter with nowhere to go, flirting badly and aggressively. He told me he knew some guys who could get me the job of my dreams. As his heavy, gold-ringed hand closed over mine, I wondered how many people he'd killed it with. Someone giggled outside, and the attendant spun away from me. There was a girl in the parking lot, just beyond the glow of the nearest streetlight. Even from the distance, she had a kind of radiant beauty that caught my breath and made it hard to look away. That's my friend, I lied quickly. Gotta go. I squirmed away toward the door, but I should have known I wouldn't be getting away that easily. The attendant followed. Your friend, huh? He hissed threateningly in my ear. You better introduce me. He didn't wait for an answer, just shouldered past me and toward the girl. When he was almost close enough to touch her, she changed. I don't know how else to describe it, but it was like her features melted away, leaving blank skin where there should have been a face. One of her hands extended and reached toward the attendant's chin like a multi-jointed spider's claw. He screamed and took off running for the bend in the mountain road up ahead, the monster fast on his heels. The attendant was in the middle of the road when the headlights of the black Mercedes whipped around the curve, way over the speed limit and much too fast to stop. For a brief moment, they illuminated a pair of glowing golden eyes where the monster had been. 
Tires squealed and swerved as the car slammed into the mountain cliff. The medical team later said that the attendant in the road was killed on impact. The two mid-ranking Yakuza in the vehicle were not wearing seatbelts and were flung from the vehicle. The gashes that severed their throats were unusual, but not inconsistent with injuries from similar accidents. Their deaths exposed a ring of drug dealers and human traffickers who used the 24-hour Kambini locations as drop-off points for their illicit business. I left Japan not long after, and I never saw the golden-eyed animal again. More than just the traumatic events I'd seen, I feared what that entity might expect me to do next. It had saved my life, however, more than once, and I wanted to pay it back somehow. That's why before I left, I paid the new Kambini attendant a hefty sum to always leave the leftover food uncovered out back along the mountainside. When I spoke to him again, he told me it always disappears by morning. <laughs>